Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Our Ocean Nation, a reclamation in honor of Earth Day today. My name is Kristen welsh -Anwalla, and I work in the Small Island Sustainability Program at the University of the Bahamas. We are pleased to partner with the Cat Island Conservation Institute for this event to bring you a series of three short documentaries that highlight the beauty of the environment of the Bahamas. We hope that these films inspire you and spark meaningful conversation regarding the natural resources and complex history of our islands. Before we begin screening the documentaries, I'd like to announce that we are recording this event and we'll make it available later online through the university social media account. Please keep your mics muted unless you want to ask a question at the end of the session, in which case you can raise your hand using the Zoom feature. And we ask that during the documentary screening, you turn off your video so we can show the films at maximum size. With that being said, I now want to invite a few opening words from Dr. Vic Nair, who's the Dean of Graduate Studies and Research, as well as a professor of sustainable tourism at UB. Dr. Nair. Thank you, thank you, Christian. Greetings from the University of the Bahamas. Welcome to the Earth Day 2021 uh, document, documentary screening and panel discussion. Thank you for taking time during this uh, restricted movement period in many parts of the world to zoom in, uh, to participate in our program. Every year, 22nd April is observed as Earth Day across the globe and people and major stakeholders uh, take part in civic activities and work towards raising awareness about critical issues that the earth is facing. Over 1 billion people spread across 192 countries participate in Earth Day activities annually. This makes uh, the day as the largest civic observance in the world. So global warming, pollution and deforestation are some of the problems routinely discussed since, the, since they pose a major threat to the nature. The theme this year is Restore Our Earth, and its focus is on natural processes, emerging green technologies, and innovative thinking that can restore the world's ecosystem. The theme also rejects the belief that only mitigation and adaptation are the ways to address climate change. In, in a year in which uh, a deadly pandemic has had the globe uh, in its grip, and climate change helped spark a cascade of calamities from ranging wildlife, wildfires to uh, volcanic eruption to, uh, to ferocious uh, hurricane season. The, fo the focus of this year's Earth Day couldn't be more timely. For the Bahamas, uh, 2019, 2020, and now 2021 has been a challenging year as we struggle our way to bounce back after Hurricane Doreen, only to face with COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The pandemic is a tragedy and its consequences will be felt for a long time. Yet, though global health condition will eventually return to a form of normal, our environment will never do so if we do not act now. Our challenges are increasingly global in nature and require systemic solutions. Hence, our environmental need, similar to global actions as what we have seen for COVID-19. So this year is the 51st anniversary of the Earth Day movement and the University of the Bahamas is glad to host this Earth Day event amidst this global pandemic that we are in. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Small Island Sustainability Program and the Cat Island uh, Conservation Institute for partnering with the Office of Graduate Studies and Research of the University of the Bahamas in having uh, two events today, starting off the three documentary screening and, and panel discussions with the production crew and later in the afternoon at another panel discussion with UB alumni working in conservation field on a call for urgent action to restore our earth. Uh, to conclude uh, in support of our Earth Day today, I would like to encourage individuals, uh, communities and businesses to turn off non-essential electrical lights for one hour from 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. tonight as a symbol of a commitment to the planet. So thank you, and I do hope you will benefit from our session today. Take care and do stay safe always. Thank you, Dr. Nair. I would now like to introduce our moderator for today's event, Ms. Kamisha Wilberg. Ms. Wilberg is a fourth year UB student in the Small Island Sustainability Program where she's focusing on marine science. She's expecting to graduate in May of this year, and she has a strong interest in pursuing a career in environmental education. 
Kamisha grew up in Matthewtown, Inagua, and currently resides on Cat Island. In addition to her studies at UB, she's also served as an intern for the last several months at the Cat Island Conservation Institute, and you'll see her feature briefly in one of the documentaries this morning. I'll now pass the event over to Kamisha to moderate. Thank you, Dr. Nwala, and good morning, everyone. I would firstly like to wish you all a very happy Earth Day and to join with Dr. Nwala and Dr. Nair to welcome you to our program this morning. So Earth Day is one of my favorite time of the year. I think that it's on par with Christmas especially at UB because we would usually come together and put on a grand event to connect students and faculty with the environment. So it is quite unfortunate that for the past two years we have had to resort to um, doing these programs virtually. However, last year's program was pretty awesome and this year we promise that we will not disappoint. So for today's program, we have two panel discussions that are planned. The first panel discussion is based on some documentaries that you will be introduced to pretty soon that were filmed by a fully Bahamian film team and included um, a lot of Bahamians. So the first documentary, it's called Bodies of Water and it highlights the complexities of the ocean and the world of opportunities that are available to us, if we can firstly understand the complex history between Bahamians and the ocean. So without further ado, I'll call on Dr. Nwala to show the first documentary. Apologies, I understand the sound. sound is not shared, so let me try again. When we are born, over 70% of our body is made of water. Over 70% of this earth is made of water. This body of water is who we are sold as slaves from a land before we could ever call it our mother. Our ancestors sailed across a sea of scriptures and, and found, found God, God in its middle, middle passage. passage. Its middle passage made permanent passengers of our passerbys, evidenced by its museum of residents who, who looked, looked like, like me. Most of us were never taught how to swim. We've only learned how to keep our head above water. How to catch a fish with bare hands. How to wet our foot on Sundays and, and holidays. Because somewhere there is a body of ocean. With an ocean of bodies. So, so we, we never go in too deep. We are shallow seas. But we carry depth even in our shallowest of hearts. Even when the shallowest of hearts boarded our borders to borrow our brothers, we, we remained anchored. Waiting for those waiting. Waiting to those waiting. We do not fear the water. This body of water is who we are. For me, the ocean is home. It has always been home. It has been a place of joy, a place of inspiration. It has given me gifts that I'm still learning about and still uncovering. As Bahamians, we have a very complex relationship with the ocean. As 90.6% of our population is of African descent, 
this means that way more than the majority of our population uh, were forcefully stolen. Our ancestors would have been stolen from uh, the African continent and transplanted onto these islands, which we now call home. And I really believe it's important for us to understand our history because in understanding our history, it helps us understand not only our identity, but also where we get to go. And I use the word get very intentionally because we get to choose what our future looks like. But before we get, you know, we, we choose what our future looks like, we, we want to have this historical context. That means that there's a lot of uh, trauma that we have that we don't even understand when it comes to our relationship with the water. You know, when you speak to many Bahamians, you'll hear them uh, reference the ocean as, a, you know, as a cemetery, thinking about how many of our ancestors did not make it. And this is something that we have to acknowledge. And as Bahamians, this is such a difficult, difficult conversation for us to have because it means we have to have painful conversations that many of us are not equipped to have, you know, because of our history, because of what was, um, that has impacted how we as Bahamians have developed. And so because of this, our relationship with the ocean is complex. Um, it's a paradox in many ways, because as island people, um, especially with, from an archipelago, we are surrounded by the ocean. You wake up, you see the ocean. You go to bed, you see the ocean. We, we, we cannot escape the ocean around us and we cannot escape our history. You know, and, and it's important for us to understand right now, as the international community is talking about ocean exploration, they're talking about it in the same curiosity and the same excitement that they talked about going to the moon all those many years ago, right? So this is our going to the moon moment or our going to Mars, but we're going to the ocean, which is home, which is our, our in our backyard, in our front yard, under our feet. Uh, so, the opportunities are endless here. So the paradox and duality of Bahamian existence is very telling when we look at the sea and the responsibility and relationship the Bahamians have had is on the one hand, a holocaust, a very negative experience, uh, part and parcel because of the transatlantic slave trade, which was inaugurated at the end of the 15th century, bringing up to 12 million persons involuntarily across the Atlantic. And that experience, uh, 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 almost like a death camp or, or a holocaust experience, is one that, that lingers even into the present with the experiences of slavery and colonialism. But at the same time, you know, our oceans, our waters also provide us with hope. So you have the holocaust versus the hope. And hope is the promise of the future that our, our marine resources hold. We are the largest Atlantic world archipelago. Our, our waters and our seascapes, uh, our entire archipelago, in fact, is, is so large and so vast. It, it provides so much opportunities for a livelihood, whether it be through sponging, uh, whether it be through fishing. Uh, we've seen communities like Spanish Wells make millionaires out of their sons and daughters. And so we have just yet to tap into this amazing potential. And, and I believe outside of our human capital, our people, our greatest assets, our greatest resources are actually under the sea. And so there is the Holocaust, this negative experience associated with enslavement and the transatlantic slave trade. But on the other side of it is the duality is the promise, the hope, the tranquility that comes with the water. All right, a place of, of bathing, of restoration, uh, of solace and, and refuge. Our waters are amazing places. I mean, astronauts have looked at the Bahamas and our waters, and, and they've noted just the beautiful color, the amazing turquoise blues, the aquamarine, the hues and shades of blue. But we pitch and sell the Bahamas as if it's a monolithic construct. It's Nassau, and the other islands are really just out there. So even though we call them a family of islands, we still treat them like they're the, the outside child. And that's un, un, unfortunate and sad. And so this is where colonialism and slavery still has a lingering legacy. And what we're seeing is though that we've shifted to being an independent country, but we're still dealing with the ghosts of the past. 
and the legacy of, of colonialism in a neo-colonial context. We know that lately Bahamians have been pining for ways to benefit from their resources. It's very important for us to manage our oceans sustainably. Over time, we realize that that's not so easily accomplished. There are many threats, including climate change, which can cause an increased frequency of hurricanes and much more severe storms. It can cause coral bleaching through the warming of our oceans. It can cause sea level rise. And at the end of the day, because we're so dependent on the oceans, we have to find ways of mitigating these impacts. And it really and truly will take us working together to accomplish this. The Department of Marine Resources uh, managed to put in place a new Fisheries Act, Fisheries Act 2020, and it allows communities to partner with the government through co-management to have a say in how these resources are managed. And because we know for the blue economy to really be developed, there are often competing interests that don't necessarily have to be competing. They can work synergistically. For example, the tourism industry, uh, you can now facilitate the viewing of turtles or sharks in marine protected areas. Um, you also need to ensure that persons can obtain food for subsistence. And at the end of the day, it really is going to take all of us working together to manage our marine resources. I want to say in conclusion and in sum, we are islanders of the sea rather than islanders of the land. And that is what distinguishes us from our Caribbean neighbors and the global north. Uh, we need to remember the sea is what gives us sustenance. As Bahamians, we have an incredible opportunity to create our future, and that looks like literally diving into the ocean. Let our relationship with the future be positive. Let us believe that there is a world of opportunities waiting for us just under the sea. And all we have to do is really believe it and dive in. Amazing. I would like to uh, encourage you all to just reflect on some of the topics and discussions that would have come up in the documentaries, because we do have persons who would have been involved in the filming and the telling of these stories here. Um, and we will have a panel discussion at the end. So just reflect on some of, the, of these things so that we can have a great conversation at the end. The second documentary, it's entitled Antonice, and it was filmed here in Cat Island, and it tells the story of a Cat Island resident, Antonice, who is on a journey to find her purpose as the guardian of the ocean. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce you to Antonice. My name is Antonise, and I'm from Nassau, but I've been living on Cat Island for about eight, nine years now. I moved to Cat Island because of my spouse. I work at Shannon's Cove. It's a trail leading to this beach, and every day I tell the guests how to get here, what to expect, and it's beautiful, but I never went. I only saw pictures of it. I live on the ocean, right in front of it but I'm a little afraid to go in the deep water 
because I'm afraid like of the sharks and stuff like that. My name is Eagle Ray Empress, also known as Nikita Shiel Roll, and I am the founder and CEO of Young Marine Explorers and the Cat Island Conservation Institute. I think for many of us, our relationship with the ocean is a bit of a paradox. The ocean is everywhere, the salt is in the air and in our hair, and at the same time, we're terrified of the ocean because we have not been taught how to love the ocean. Many of us are really afraid of the ocean. Young Marine Explorers is a nonprofit organization. The focus of our work is ensuring that all members in our community have the tools necessary to protect the ocean. And to me, this is training to become a certified community marine scientist. This is a brand new trade that we're developing here in Cat Island. As time go on, I will have a greater appreciation for the ocean. Superhero names are a reflection of our deepest and truest selves. When I'm Eagle Ray Empress, I can do all the things. RJ is the son of Antonis. He loves the ocean. He's like a little guppy. I remember one time he came to me and he was like, Mom, I could swim. And he jumped in the back of the rock and he was diving and he was swimming. I was like, oh, you can swim. Nothing makes him happier than time spent in the ocean. I chose my superhero name because I feel like a king and I love the ocean. With my work at the institution, I am forever in service to the Ocean King. We've been working with Antonise for some time now to remember what her superhero name is. She's going to be telling us very soon. Sometimes the world can be a dark and scary place. And sometimes it can be hard to show up as yourself, especially when you're living in a society that was designed to oppress you. We are inside what history tells us is the great house of Andrew DeVoe on the Andrew DeVoe Plantation in Port Howe, Cat Island. This is standing in a home that was built based on oppression. The ancestors of the people who live in Port Howe, they were enslaved people forced to serve Andrew DeVoe. And I want us to take a minute to just settle into ourselves and to think about how we are feeling being in here. I feel sorrow for my ancestor. You know, I, I feel a pain. Yeah, it's just, um, it's, a, it's heavy. Your life in many ways has been shaped by the colonial history that has been a huge chapter in the behem in our country. <laughs> this work here is gonna change our country because you are brave to say yes to something new, to say yes to something scary, and to feel, to feel the sadness, to feel the pain, and also be able to look out at that ocean and look at the beauty and the diamonds and know that that's yours. We just spent this morning acknowledging our past and sitting with it and crying with it. Now we're looking out to our future, which is the ocean. Sometimes feel like you know, society and the world make it seem like we don't even deserve it, mm. you know? You wanna go talk to mama now? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I'm gonna let you do that by yourself. Okay. I'm really excited to do my first dive, no. I have never been snorkeling before. Become a 
in one what the ocean means, taking that fair out of you. The ocean will provide hope and a future for us as Bahamians. When I relaxed myself and I became one with the ocean, it was amazing. I have mad respect for the ocean. We should treat it with the utmost respect. That's some serious stuff down there. That's no joke. The coral reef and the water is so beautiful under there. It is so, so, so beautiful. I will definitely be back. Can you talk to me a little bit about the process of identifying or remembering your superhero name? I had a discussion with my son, the Ocean King, and he actually helped me come up with my superhero name. And he was like, Mommy, you know what? You should be the Ocean Queen because I see you as my queen. You know, I see you as royalty. My name is Antonis, and I am the Ocean Queen. Our final documentary is entitled Plastic Warriors, and it tells the story of superhero Crystal Ocean, formerly known as Crystal Ambrose. She is a Bahamian marine environmental scientist who sailed across the Pacific Ocean to study an oceanic garbage patch. She returned home to inspire each of us and the government of the Bahamas to move toward a plastic-free Bahamas. Crystal is currently pursuing her PhD and is currently in class, which is why she is unable to join us today. However, please focus your attention once again to the screen as we watch Plastic Warriors. The marine litter concentrations for the Bahamas and the wider Caribbean are almost three times the global average. And in 2025, the projected plastic pollution accumulation for the Bahamas is expected to increase to some 687 million metric tons. And this is in the place that I call home the place where the amount of plastic pollution invading our shorelines actually displaces the biomass of the people who live here. And this is paradise. You know, this is where I'm from. This is a vacationer's dream. But when you peel back the veils of this idyllic space, you begin to see that paradise is actually polluted by plastic. And in often cases, it's plastic that doesn't even belong to us. My name is Crystal Ambrose, also known as Crystal Ocean, and I'm a self-proclaimed plastic warrior. Ever since I was a little girl, I've had this, this love affair with the ocean. You know, I remember being so little, riding on a Sunday in my father's truck and seeing the horizon of the ocean and just being mesmerized and so curious and astonished by this, this deep blue. The one person in my family who had the strongest relationship to the ocean was my father. He taught us to swim, but in the most unconventional way. He didn't give us the skill and the technique, but he tossed us into the deep end. And we had to fend for ourselves, sink or swim, but we always knew that he was always one swim away. And when I reflect on my life and my time with my father and his connection to the ocean, I realized that he was preparing me for something bigger. I see that he was preparing me for the biggest fight of my life. And that fight being the fight for the thing that I love the most, the ocean, and protecting it against plastic pollution.
I never set out to um, save the Bahamas from plastic or from waste or anything like that, but for the life of me, I kept having these visions and these manifestations of the whole country moving with me to move towards this Bahamas that was free of plastic debris. And it was in that moment that Bahamas Plastic Movement was born. And we're the grassiest grassroots organization you can think of. We're totally community and youth-based. People that are connected to the ocean, connected to the environment, and committed to making a difference. Through research, education, citizen science, and policy change all around plastic pollution, those are the things that we focus on to help develop solutions to this crisis in our own country. And even though we're so focused on plastic pollution, our organization is really rooted in the hopefulness of engaging youth and young people in education and activism around plastic pollution. A core component of our organization is our Plastic Pollution Education and Ocean Conservation Summer Camp, uh, also known as the Plastic Camp. And during this time, we have students that come from around the Bahamas to learn all about the issue. And for me, working with youth is so important because they're the next generation, right? We start there, they're the ones that are, are molding their own futures. They're the ones that deserve a seat at the table at making decisions that impact their future. You know, youth, they're strong, powerful, and effective leaders. When they speak, the world listens. And I personally believe that youth are the change. So in our program, our students, they come in, they learn all about the issue through hands-on connections with scientific research. You know, they're out on the boat trawling for microplastics in the ocean. They're dissecting the stomachs of fish like mahi-mahi or birds like albatross to see if they're actually ingesting plastic. And it's in this moment where they make the connection between how their lifestyle on land actually impacts animals and animals that they like to eat. They're doing the art and the activism around this issue. They're pushing policy and having their voices heard and realizing that they have the power to affect change. And that's what it's about. It's connecting students to the ocean so that they are empowered to make a difference within their own lives, their own schools, homes, communities, and most importantly, in our country, where we're surrounded by water, where we're surrounded by so much plastic that's invading our shores. They are the ones that are gonna be at the front lines making a difference they are the plastic warriors. Crystal ha has so much amazing energy and I think that she gets that from growing up here in the Bahamas and that makes the show run. She brings all of her energy and good vibes and her amazing work with kids and she gets everyone so excited about what they're doing and really connects them in a way that we couldn't do ourselves and so we love learning from her and having her there. The first time I saw Crystal, I felt off her energy and I feel like it's so inspiring how even when times may be rough for her, she still gives us energy and positivity to make sure that we feel great and that we feel confident and that we have a better learning experience. Being an alumni of Bahamas Plastic Movement and working with Ms. Crystal has changed how I view how plastic affects the environment and has made me more self-conscious when I'm using certain products. It has deepened my passion for the ocean and the marine life that lives inside, and it has also made me more outspoken when spreading awareness. If I was to describe Crystal in one word, I would say bright, because she just brings light to every situation, and she's just so inspiring and makes everybody happy. Crystal brings a unique joy to her work, um, and she has a unique passion for empowering um, young people and people of color to enter the conversation about environmental conservation. And that's something that nobody had really focused on up to now. She's from this little country, this tiny country of islands that people know only for sun, sand, and sea. And yet she is playing a leading role in one of the most complex global environmental issues. She is leading um, policy and activism and actually, you know, in the Bahamas, innovating a way forward to, to expand the conversation about combating pollution is revolutionary and the biggest part about it because of the youth work um, being challenging and the environmental work being challenging Crystal brings joy she brings joy to the work and that is magic my favorite thing about here is is the connection to the sea right you look outside and you see kids swimming in the ocean and it's such a beautiful thing and at this beach you look and you see, it looks clean. But when you take a closer look at other beaches that surround this beautiful island, 
you'll see that our paradise is actually polluted, you know, and often by plastic that washes in from a foreign source. I, I hate that I can't stand the thought of a child from another generation of anyone not experiencing the ocean for years to come. And that's what drives me to continue this work. The connection my father has to the ocean, the connection of my country to the ocean, I am viscerally tied to the ocean. And that visceral feeling is what inspires me and keeps me going in, in my fight to protect it. Why? This was so wonderful. It is really inspiring to see Bahamians, different Bahamians work um, in their own creative ways to effect change in our environment and restore our earth. Um, it is now time for us to be introduced to the various persons who were involved in creating these films and telling the stories that were told. So I'm gonna now introduce the panelists. Starting with our film team, we have Mr. Lobato Stubbs, who is an award-winning director and producer, born and raised in Nassau, Bahamas. In 2014, he received the Bahamian Icon Award. Lobato formed his own production company, Count Floyd Productions. Over the years, he has progressed the brand from a small startup to a budding creative organization nailing work for critically acclaimed short documentaries and music videos for major label artists. In addition to these achievements, Lovato and his company have worked on commercials, documentaries, and many other multimedia projects with Bahamian companies and international artists. We also have Mr. Tony Williams, he is a filmmaker that has been shooting professionally since 2013. He graduated in 2013 from Taylor University with a Bachelor of Arts in Film and Media Production. Since graduation, he has shot or worked on a variety of shoots, such as international television shows with National Geographic, Bravo TV, ABC, and commercials, documentaries, and local music videos. Tony currently resides in Nassau, Bahamas with his beautiful wife, Gina. Finally, we have Ms. Tracy Stubbs, who is a sound engineer from Nassau, Bahamas, where she lives and works. Coming from musically inclined families, along with her natural love for writing, live bands, and the arts in general, led her into the world of entertainment and media production. While Tracy specializes in live music, sound reinforcement. Her services also include church sound, recording, sound for film, video, hosting, and co-hosting live music events and production. So now I'm going to invite our members of the film team. If you can kindly um, put on your videos and unmute your mics so that you can answer the question. So each person in the film team will be asked the same question and you have two minutes to respond. So the question is beginning with Lava. Misha, you're muted. Oh. Wow, thank you. Okay, so I was um, about to introduce the persons who were a part of the creation of the films, beginning with the film team. So I'm beginning with Le Battle Stubbs, who is the director of all three films. He is an award-winning director and producer, born and raised in Nassau, Bahamas. 
In 2014, he received the Bohemian Icon Award. Lovato formed his own production company, Kunk Boy Film. Over the year, he has progressed the band from a small startup to a budding creative organization, nailing work for critically acclaimed short documentaries and music videos for major label artists. In addition to these achievements, Lovato and his company have worked on commercials, documentaries, and many other multimedia projects with Bohemian companies and international artists. We also have Tony Williams, who is a filmmaker that has been shooting professionally since 2013. He graduated in 2013 from Taylor University with a Bachelor's of Arts in Film and Media Production. Since graduation, he has shot or worked on a variety of shoots, such as international television shows with National Geographic, Bravo TV, and ABC. Also, he's worked on commercials, documentaries, and local music videos. Tony currently resides in New Providence, Bahamas with his beautiful wife, Gina Williams. And finally, we have Ms. Tracy Stubbs, who is a sound engineer from Nassau, Bahamas, where she lives and works. Coming from musically inclined families, along with her natural love for writing, live bands, and the arts in general, led her into the world of entertainment and media production. While Tracy specializes in live sound, in live music, sound reinforcement, her services also include church sound, recording, sound for film and video, hosting, co-hosting live music events, and production. So, I am going to invite the film team to unmute their mics and if you can please turn on your cameras. Each person is going to be asked the same question and you have two minutes to give your responses. So I'm going to start with our director, Lovato Stubbs. So the question is, reflecting on the creation of Antonis and the day that we all filmed at Andrew DeVoe Plantation. Please share how your perspective around the environment and the ocean has transformed and how your superhero powers such as production, cinematography, or sound skills were fundamental to this transformation. The battle. Thank you for your introduction. Um, very, very honored to create these three documentaries and tell our amazing story as behemoths. Um, you know, like, I always like to say that, you know, um, our past don't necessarily define our future, but, um, you know, we have to honor our ancestors. It's important. Our ancestors is a part of our culture as behemoths, is a part of us, is a part of who we are. Uh, it's important that we, we still own that, you know, um, that, you know, that we have these amazing stories in the Bahamas and these amazing things that we could use our tools as filmmaking to tell these stories to the world. Um, and, you know, the great thing about this production, you know, especially in Cat Island, you know, I'm, I'm very tied and connected to Cat Island. My grandfather um, was, was born and raised in Cat Island, moved to, to Nassau, became a, you know, a pioneer black behemoth photographer. Uh, and so, so this whole thing was to honor Cat Island and to honor that story and the history um, and featuring a behemoth, Antonise, that, that, that make us so proud and so brave to tell a story um, she represents all of us as behemoths and it's so important. So, so going back to, you know, the question you asked is it's, 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 it's amazing. It's important that we, we use our superpowers as filmmaking to tell these stories. And like Nikita, you know, we, we, like I like to talk about with Nikita, um, who was not only on the production team, but featured in these documentaries, it's behemoth magic. And um, we're able to use our tools and have a behemoth crew on this production, you know, Tony, Tracy, Mani, um, so many other other amazing behemoths that was on this project to, to tell the story. And, um, you know, it just makes it all around special, you know, um, we tell our story about us as a people, our history, our ocean that surrounds us um, all around. And, um, you know, with that said, you know, in concluding, um, also like to, to shout out and honor the other individuals and other documentaries that we created, um, Plastic Warriors, Crystal, and the movement she's doing um, and making change. And, and, and I was just a vehicle as a filmmaker to tell that story 
and she created change in our country, you know, in our entire country. Um, Bodies of Waters, um, you know, Mr. Chris Curry, um, my former teacher, which is amazing, full circle working with him again, um, Dr. Giddens, um, the amazing poets at the beginning of Bodies of Waters, Disha and D'Angelo for, for creating the, the intro and, and the, the voice to, to tell our story um, in such a poetic way. So it's all around Bohemian magic. Um, and like I said, our past don't necessarily define our future, but we got to honor our ancestors because our ancestors are part of us as a culture, a part of us as Bohemians, and it's a part of our entire being as, as, as who we are and how we move in our culture, you know? So yeah, so that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> Well said, well said. Tracy, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, sorry. Hello, everyone, and happy Earth Day to everyone. Um, going to the Andrew DeVoe plantation was a bit, it was emotional, I would say, um, but I'm really, really glad that I was able to be a part of the entire production. Um, you know, part of the reason why I got into, me into media production is to be in a position to be a part of these kinds of projects. And like, <laughs> I remember being teased as a kid for caring about the environment, which was crazy. I remember in high school wanting to become a marine biologist and being literally laughed at, <laughs> like very, very loudly and hard. And I couldn't understand why those things were supposed to be expected to be out of my reach. And um, so working on this, um, as far as my superhero powers and using them, um, I'm just glad that I was able to do it because you don't have many Bahamian sound mixers for local or foreign productions. We have a lot of foreign productions coming and, and they want to, you know, everything is always shot outside in the environment. It, 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 more times than not on a beach and a lot, a lot, a lot of times on a boat. And so I am constantly there. And like, I worked on the Antonis film and that was very touching to me because honestly, I know that a lot of people don't uh, know how to swim, didn't grow up, you know, swimming in the water or have some kind of fear. And I have zero, zero fear <laughs> like that. Um, I, 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 my parents made sure that we were always had a connection. We were always at the beach, this, that, the next thing. And so to, if, if this film could help to inspire more people to have the courage to try and to go out there and actually do it, um, to learn it, to encourage their children to learn how to swim kind of thing, I, like, I feel very happy and successful, really, really, truly happy and successful. Um, and then also to like working with an amazing team that was that was like just all the fun in the world. I think it's one of the best projects I have had the opportunity to work on since I started doing sound. So yeah, that's that's where I'm at with it. Amazing, amazing. We are not limited to what we can do when it comes to the environment. That's amazing. Uh, is uh, Tony there? Hey, I'm there. Hi, Tony. Yeah. yeah. How you doing? Um, I guess for me, it was going to the plantation. It was pretty just sitting down and actually, at least thank you, Nikita, for having us sit down and actually think about how this building came to be, you know, um, because usually a lot of times I just if I see a building like that, you know, just say, oh, okay, this uh, building is historical, but we just drive right past it or whatever, take a photo and that's it. But just to be inside of it and just sit down and have a good talk. I think that was like a 40 to 45 minute talk about just what this plant, what this building means and how it was created and who inhabited it and where, you know, our ancestors probably didn't even, wasn't even able to stay in, to live inside the house, but probably built it, you know? So it like stuff like that and just come to the realization of that. And Kamisha, you, you were there too, you know, Anthony, Nikita, even the, the driver who's driving us around, he, he had a good conversation, you know? So it, it was it was, it was was revolutionary for me. I, I think it was pretty, uh, it, it was good just to sit down and 
just think about it, you know, and think about the, impl the, the implications of that even today, you know, I feel it sometimes too, you know, when I go in certain areas or when I talk to certain people. And, but it, 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 was, it, was, it was a good day. It was a good day. Um, overall, the shoot was, was great. Uh, I think it was five days, I believe. You now we are over in Cat Island and get able to see like the different uh, scenery and whatnot. My first time in Cat Island actually being there for that long. You know, just to take in the scenery and just realize how beautiful the waters are in Cat Island. You know, so overall, it's a great experience for me. Amazing. Thank you for sharing. And it's awesome to have all of these different um, perspectives. You know, we have the, the people who are in the back of the camera, but they still had such a great and important role in, in showcasing these um these stories and telling these stories. So thank you so much for your efforts and thank you so much for your wonderful responses. So now we're going to move on to the persons who are in front of the cameras. Um, we're gonna begin with our poets who told such a strong and inspiring poem at the beginning. So I'm gonna introduce you to Disha Fraser who is a Bahamian visual and spoken word artist. She found her passion by telling stories through photographs and poetry. After graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree in visual, Deisha founded Key Focus Photography to gracefully connect her passion for the arts with her spirit of entrepreneurship. Deisha became the first Bohemian spoken word artist to compete in the International Women of the World Poetry Slam in 2010. She also taught and mentored young adults in Arizona and was the head coach of Phoenix 2011 Ray, New, New Voices Youth Poetry Slam team. Deisha is actively involved in the Bahamian spoken word community. She helps to create a platform for poets. She organizes poetry, open mic events, and features various poets on the miscellaneous poetry tours spoken word platform. And we have D'Angelo, who is also a poet and was involved in creating such a beautiful piece. D'Angelo possesses a great passion and talent for the arts. Known by the name Harsh Reality, D'Angelo honed in his own craft and became a nationally recognized spoken word artist. Following his passion, he continued stressing the importance and presence of spoken word poetry by starting his own show called Speak in 2012 which continued on until 2016. He was the first poet to perform the tattoo on the tattoo stage for our national independence celebration, and also one of the two brilliant minds behind the top spoken word yearly tour in the country called Miscellaneous Poetry. He also takes pride in his other national performances at the National Heart Foundation Ball and the inaugural Junk New Carnival. We also have our very own Dr. Christopher Curry, who was born in the Bahamas and earned his doctorate degree in history from the University of Connecticut in 2011. Currently, he serves as Associate Professor of History and Chair of the School of Social Sciences at the University of the Bahamas. Outside of these professional responsibilities, he has published several books and articles and presented at several academic conferences, including Harvard University's 2010 Atlantic World Summer Institute. Additionally, he has been involved with numerous public relation engagements, including talk shows, roundtable discussions, and television interviews. Dr. Curry currently serves as the chair of the National Reparations Commission and is the Director of Education on the Clifton Heritage Authority Board. Finally, we have Ms. Anthony Anton, who is also known as the Ocean Queen. She is 29 years old and the mother of Raymond Paul, the Ocean King. Anthony lives in the settlement of Town in Cat Island. She is a waitress at Shana Cove Resort, where she enjoys engaging in meaningful conversations with the guests who visit from all over the world. Antonise is also in training with the Cat Island Conservation Institute to become a certified community marine scientist. She is learning how to have an appreciation for ocean life and her surroundings through the community-based conservation programs. 
So similarly, similarly, similarly to the film team, I'm gonna invite you all to unmute your mics. And if you could please turn on your cameras, you have two minutes to answer the question. The question is as follows. Reflecting on the messages that you shared in these documentaries, what does it mean to you to have participated in the creation and telling of our shared history as it relates to the ocean, our past, and our collective future? And I would call on Ms. Disha to answer first. Hey guys, uh, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Happy Earth Day. Um, being a part of the film, uh, first of all, it's just an honor uh, to um, work with everyone, D'Angelo and uh, the entire um, film crew. And I think it's important to tell the story um, of the relationship of Bahamians to the water from a Bahamian's perspective. You know, I think that um, it's super important to, to capture that, um, to share my story, Deandra's story, and the, the story of so many Bahamians at large, you know, just um, thinking about how many Bahamians, how we're surrounded by this beautiful water and so many Bahamians uh, don't go in the water or don't know how to swim, you know, and in the exploration of understanding these things, um, you know, just realizing, um, you know, uh, certain things as well, like understanding our history and maybe the impact that our history has, ha has had or has on our relationship with the water and, you know, maybe our hesitancy to, to go too far deep into the water, you know. Um, so and just just being able to work on that and just hoping that, you know, just with the poem, with the documents, we were able to uh, spark that interest uh, from within ourselves and also um, uh, anybody who's able to, to view it to just um, maybe be okay to explore the beauty that we have around us because so many people fly here uh, from all parts of the different um, all parts of the world just just for the the waters and the beauty of it you know and just um, if, and we have this right in our back doors you know uh, so just being able to have the opportunities take take advantage of the opportunities to to explore the, the, the beauty and the resources that we have around us um i you know i'd, I'd be so excited to, to see when um, we could fully um just own that and just dive right into the things that we have here and have access to amazing thank you tisha tiangelo uh, good morning, everyone. I'm not sure if everyone can hear me. Can hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Uh, but um, it was it was a humbling experience, definitely. I, I concur with Tisha. Um, it was an honor to to be a part of of such an undertaking, um, in Bahamian culture and history. Um, and like Tisha said, I still have to reiterate that it's important for the story to to be heard and to be able to be related to in a way uh, that only Bahamians can. And um, it was important to hear that from Bahamians, people that, that look just like you, talk just like you. Uh, you can see them every day, they go to the same beaches and they have the same apprehension due to uh, a history that we, we, you know, we don't have a lot of knowledge on. And to bring that knowledge is to bring an understanding, it's to bring an awareness, it's to bring an acknowledgement and it spirals into so many uh, different parts of the bigger scope of things in terms of our entire country and our entire nation. And I just think that um, understanding it is the first step in understanding who we are. And once you can understand who you are, you can make progress in ways in so many different ways. So I think that this is just the first step and I'm excited to be a part of it. Thank you so much, Lovato, uh, Nikita for the opportunity. And um, I'm excited to see how much more progress can get done as we go forward. Thank you, D'Angelo. I liked how you said that we have to first understand where we are, where we were, to understand where we get to go. And it's very interesting that we have Dr. Christopher Curry here, who might be able to share a little bit on that as well. So I'm going to invite Dr. Curry to unmute his mic and give his response. 
Uh, I'm so happy to be celebrating Earth Day with this wonderful group of people. Um, I have with me in this platform, former students like Luado. I have uh, comrades in arms with people like Nikita, um, Earth Empress. I, I have so many people who um, I consider to be important contributors to our national development. And I feel the value of this story is in being able to to, to think about history in a different way. Um, one definition of history is, is collective memory. And unfortunately, you know, our history oftentimes gets told by, by people who don't have an intimate knowledge of our country's geography and, and our water and, and the place that we call home. And so I feel this documentary is, is important because it begins to shift the discourse and discussion about our history in a way that allows Bahamians to own it. Um, I feel that the, the waters uh, that surround our islands uh, have that uh, duality that I spoke about in the documentary, the, the paradox of being haunted by the memories of the transatlantic slave trade, but also providing us with the hope, uh, the hope that comes from understanding that we are the largest Atlantic world archipelago. Uh, we have almost infinite marine resources uh, beyond um, the seabeds and the deeper trenches in our, in our waters. Uh, and yet uh, we have to be so careful about how we interact with the ocean today because we have people far and wide who will want to come in and exploit our marine resources. And we have to have a better sense of the importance of preserving and maintaining and protecting. And sometimes that means fighting uh, for what is ours. And, and so this film gives me an opportunity to really feel like a, uh, a nationalist, you know, to feel patriotic about what we consider our own and to know that this film and these films were produced, directed, managed, uh, choreographed, organized, planned by Bahamians and produced a phenomenal project. I mean, when I look at the films, I am just so proud to be a Bahamian. And, um, and so I just want to say thank you for allowing me to be a part of the project. And I'm so happy that we have a voice and a narrative that we can tell and we can share with the rest of the world now. Thank you so much, Dr. Curry. Last we'll have Anthony's. Hello, can everybody hear me? Hi, we can hear you. Okay, <laughs> Okay. first of all, I just want to say happy Earth Day, everybody. Um, being a part of this film, it was so amazing. I am I'm forever grateful to Nakia for allowing me to be a part of this. Special thanks to the camera crew, the Vado, and everybody who was a part of it. Being a part of this film, it meant so much to me. Before I was a part of this film and also before I was a part of Nikita organization, the CICI, um, I had really no understanding or appreciation for what it truly meant, to, what it truly meant to have ocean appreciation. And being a part of this film helps me and educated me on that. Um, I will forever be grateful to um, Nikita and to the ocean, you know. Um, before I did this film, I really didn't have no connection to the ocean per se. And I just wanted to say to um, the two people who did the poem Bisha and D'Angelo. Um, that was one of my favorite parts of the film. Like your poem moved me and it really touched, touched me as well. And I could relate to it, you know, because I lived, I lived literally right on the beach and only put my foot like right in the water, never went past my shoulders. So that piece of the film was really my favorite. So yeah. I just um, happy and excited to move forward and having a more appreciation for the ocean and learning as much as I can about it as well. 
Amazing. I am so happy and grateful to have, have the opportunity to sit here and listen to all of these different perspectives of all of these Bahamians who have different creativity, you know, different ways to effect change in the environment and restore the earth. Thank you so much for your responses. So now I am going to introduce to you Miss Samaya Cargill and Ms. Nikita Shiro, um, who will bring the final, answer the final question for the morning. Okay, so Samaya Cargill is an is a Canadian educated industrial engineer who is focused on system, sorry, who is focused on systemic improvement and change management in the business environment. She is currently the head unit, the unit head of strategic development and initiatives at the Bahamas Development Bank, where she is focused on integrating sustainable development frameworks into daily operations for the bank and generating projects that combine creativi creativity and financing, technical assistance and policy advocacy for innovation in the colored economies. And we have Ms. Nikita Shiro, who is an oceanographer, a conservation biologist, a hydroponic farmer, an estate agent, an, an, an advocate and activist. And most importantly, she is a superhero. Her name is Eagle Ray Empress. However, Nikita Shiro is just a government name. So my question to Ms. Samaya and Nikita. The colored economies, blue for ocean, green for lands, and orange for the arts, have been highlighted in national conversations around the sustainable development of our ocean. Thinking and taking, uh, thinking about everything that would have been said today and taking into consideration the impacts of Hurricane Dorian and COVID-19, what opportunities are available for Bahamians and how can these opportunities be used to drive equitable, sustainable development in the Bahamas over the next decade? I'm gonna call on Samaya to go first. Thank you, Kamisha. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so BDB was founded in 1974 as a mechanism to support wealth generation and economic empowerment for Bahamians. In recent years, we are focused on international standards of development, such as the SDGs, along with a specific emphasis on the colored economies as a means to support the diversification and resilience of our overall economy. So COVID-19 and Hurricane Dorian have shown us that self-sufficiency and sustainability have to be national priorities. We need to emphasize greater ownership in a way that doesn't strain our environment. As a country, we are in a transitional stage where we're adapting with what we've been dealt with while currently seeking the best way to ensure resilience to future events. So the blue economy is particularly important because of the sheer size of our ocean resource. Our oceans have the ability to provide food, energy, transportation, and much of what we need to increase the quality of life for everyday Bahamians. Of course, on this journey towards balancing social progress, environmental sustainability, and economic growth, we have to acknowledge our history of slavery and colonization and the legacies of power and ideologies that have been left in place. We have to confront, dismantle, and reimagine the structures of our socioeconomic fabric that work to privilege some people and exclude others if we're going to meet the underlying principles of the sustainable development goals. That is that no one is left behind. So the bank is committed to ensuring equitable access to benefits and resources of our country for all people, youth, women, family islanders, and so on. And that has to be done in conjunction with a broad spectrum of voices that speak to solutions that empower all Bahamians, so mechanisms that respect our culture and our, and our environment. So because of this philosophical approach, we are looking to engage through our Blue Economy Think Tank on the 28th, where we will be exploring four themes, food of the future, bioextractives, maritime industry, energy, and of course, blue arts and culture. And so often these issues of conservation and innovation are limited to certain silos, but we wanna open those up, those conversations up so that all Bahamians can participate in this reimagining that we're talking about of how we better utilize our natural resources in a way that supports sustainable livelihoods. And so we have an amazing lineup of speakers, including representatives from the Caribbean Development Bank, the Biodiversity Center of the University of West Indies, Future Fish, and many Bahamians like Lovato who are involved in innovative blue economy projects. 
And so the bank has committed to at least a million dollars in financing for each of the college economies, green, orange, and blue, for innovative businesses, and along with a small grant program. So we encourage everyone to come out, participate, and if you have an innovative business idea in a color economy, come to BDB and see how we can support you. Thank you, Sunaya, for that information. That was that was wonderful. Um, we're going to call on Ms. Nikita Shiro to answer the question. Oh my goodness. Hello, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here, sending so much ocean love your way all the way from Cat Island, the heart of Cat Island. This is, you know what, Lovato said it, it's Bahamian magic. And I love me some Bahamian magic. We have so much to offer the world. And this is a great day. Happy Earth Day. So it's such an honor to have so many stakeholders and people from different perspectives, different walks of life on this call. You know, I'm seeing a number of my Cat Island fam who've been zooming in and I love that. Um, I love that we have representation from the bank and talking about how do we move forward, you know, and these documentaries, it's my wish that these documentaries are really going to help to facilitate a national conversation so we can lovingly dive into our history and all those pain points because there are a lot of them. And as I think Samaya said so eloquently, it impacts, our history impacts how we've developed. And I love that there's intentionality now in how we move forward. And this is where I think we have an incredible opportunity. It is, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm so excited that we're at this point where we get to imagine and we get to create. And I really want to inspire you and encourage you to start asking the questions because especially in the knowledge economy, you know, by answering the questions is how we drive that economy forward. And so, and when we look at our ocean, when we, we look at what is possible for us as Bahamians now, we get to dream big. And I think often because we're, we're so, we're, we, we live in these very small communities, often there's not much exchange between the different communities that we operate within. And this can um, narrow our perspective and our understanding of ourselves, but then also our role in the world. And what I, I think what we need to remember is because we're such a small country, this gives us a huge competitive advantage because we can test and trial projects out specifically as it relates to the ocean, understand how, you know, Antonise and I were on the beach this morning in preparation for today. And, you know, we were talking about, she was asking me questions on, well, can we, what can we do with the skin of the fish? because all the you know, fishermen all just skin the fish and throw it away. You know, and it, it's questions like this that are going to spark that curiosity and that at this, uh, this think tank on uh, next week, we're really gonna be able to dive into. And um, so, so what I wanna say is celebrate today. You know, this is the beginning of really a new future for us as Bahamians and we get to co-create that together. And I think what we will realize is that when we can shift from, as everyone calls it, the crabs in a bucket, you know, perspective, black crab syndrome, where if Lovato shining, it means I'm not gonna shine. Mm, that's, that, that's, that's from the past. All right, now what we understand is really this abundance mindset that I know that when Lovato shines, I shine brighter. When Kamisha shines, I shine brighter. And so we all get to shine together and it's incredible that we have support both through you know, the university. Now is the time, especially students on this panel, talk to your professors, hit them up, ask questions, see how you can come up with ideas and then bring them to the bank and you know what, it's gonna be a process. Building a biz business is not easy. I say that firsthand. Um, and you know what, through the right support, the fact that a number of us have gone through this before, we can work together. Um, and I'm really seeing some incredible things in our future. You know, so think big, dream big. And if you're having problems dreaming, seeing beyond the shore, find yourself a friend or remember your superhero name and then show up as your superhero. And, uh, it's all just magic from there. So thank you so much for this great conversation. I look forward to hearing what everyone else has to say. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of the panelists. Uh, your, um, your words, your answers, they were really effective. Um, uh, and, and especially in the, with the topic, the theme of Earth Day this year. 
I am now going to open up the floor to entertain questions from the audience, whether you have any questions, comments, or concern for any of our panelists, you can leave your questions, comments, concerns in the chat box, or you can feel free to raise your hands and I will identify you to unmute your mics and ask your questions. Misha, I'd like to point out in the chat box that we do have a question um, regarding drilling uh, from Denise Hoyler. So um, concerned about stories of drilling in our once pristine waters for oil. Can anybody on the panel speak to that? So I will actually take that question. Uh, Denise, thank you so much for bringing that up. And this is a serious conversation that we as Bahamians need to have because uh, right now BPC, Bahamas Petroleum Company, uh, does have leases to drill in the Bahamas. Um, you know, many of you will recall that they had a test well a couple of months ago that turned out to be not economically viable. And so when I, when they sort of had their press release, they announced that there were there was some disappointment about that. And I think many Bahamians thought that because the well was deemed not economically viable, they thought that, well, that was it, that the story was over. And that is not the case. Um, so it's it's extremely important now. What needs to happen as we move forward is that our voices, the, the voices represented by Antony's, by Disha, D'Angelo, Lovato, and everyone else, we need to become part of this conversation. And we have to understand really what is at stake. And uh, this is, I think, one of the greatest challenges that we see as a nation, whether we're talking about oil or unsustainable development, um, is that Bahamians have not had a fair advantage at the starting point in these conversations. You know, I'm just going to pivot quickly to White House Point, and I, I really want to acknowledge the fact that when developments or um, come into communities, especially a community like North Eleuthera, or for example, um, the, it, when communities have been abandoned, when communities feel like they've been abandoned and there is a glimmer of hope, you cannot get between me and that hope right now because I have no other options. And so I think when we move into development, we have to be very clear that we have to ensure that we are negotiating from a position of strength. And that requires all Bahamians to have our feet firmly planted in the ground and not be operating in crisis mode. And right now, most Bahamians are operating from crisis mode and cannot negotiate from strength when right. you're in crisis. Um, so that's what I'm gonna say on that. There's a lot of national conversation that has to happen and I'm more than happy, please reach out to me to facilitate, uh, to continue the conversation. Okay, there is another question that was asked privately. It says, uh, has the plastic ban been successful? When would full implementation happen? Um, Akira, can you speak to that? Okay. <laughs> so, um, so yes, the, the plastic ban has came into place and that was specific for single use plastic bags, uh, plastic straws and um, some other items. Of course, as you know, what we're talking about is change and transition. And, and I think the government has been aware of that. There is a phasing of this process. Um, but really, at the end of the day, it's about you and me and all of us really owning the decision. And this goes for everything as it relates to the environment. Yet the government helps. They put guidance and structures in place. They help to create laws. And we can be and should be active participants in the reviewing of the laws that are created. But at the end of the day, we have to be the ones who step up and really help hold people accountable. And that goes for ourselves when we go into a store and if they give us plastic, you know, ask a question. Um, because we're the ones who make up society. And so if people aren't abiding by it, the onus is on us. And I think this is where this paradigm shift has to take place that we, we have to own. And then also we got to support our government, you know, because regardless of administration now, at the end of the day, the government administers and governs us. And we need to make sure that we're using our voices in rolling that out. Thank you, Nikita. Are there any more questions for any of our panelists? Okay. 
Okay, I don't see any more questions. So I would like to once again, thank our panelists for being a part of this discussion. And I will turn the program over to Dr. Kristen Anwala. Thank you, Kamisha. So I hope you all enjoyed this event today and that the films have inspired you. Documentaries are available on the Only One and Cat Island Conservation Institute websites with the links sent in the chat box. So please be um, sure to share them with your family and friends. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our moderator, Ms. Kamisha Wilberg for leading to the, today's event, as well as our panelists for sharing these documentaries with us and giving time today to answer questions about the film. I'd also like to thank Ms. Nikita Shilroll and the Cat Island Conservation Institute for helping to make today's event happen. Finally, thank you to all of you, the audience for attending this event and for your thought-provoking questions as well. So as a reminder, we are hosting another event at 1 p.m., which is a panel discussion with UB alumni. We hope you can join us. I've dropped a chat, uh, the link in the chat box, so feel free to register for that and you'll get the Zoom link for that as well. So thank you again to everyone. We wish you a happy Earth Day. Take care of yourself and of the Earth. Bye.